Fire on the Mountain, Part 1. In 1859, the abolitionist John Brown, fresh from a successful guerrilla war that kept Kansas from entering the Union as a slave state, attacked the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, with a small force of armed men. Brown came to Virginia to fulfill a lifelong dream, to carry the war against slavery into Africa, as he put it, by putting a small army of runaway slaves and abolitionists into the Blue Ridge and heading south. Brown's idea was that such a force, even if militarily weak, would terrorize the slave owners, embolden the slaves, and hasten the polarization which was already splitting the nation apart. Others obviously agreed. He had raised funds to buy the most modern weaponry and recruited the experienced black slavery fighter, Harriet Tubman, to be his second in command. The raid was symbolically timed for Independence Day, July 4th, 1859, but Tubman fell sick and key supplies were delayed. After a three month delay, Brown and 21 men struck Harper's Ferry on October 16th without Tubman. Through a combination of military errors and bad luck, they were cut off in the town and defeated by U.S. Marines, led by a West Point graduate named Robert E. Lee. Brown and five others were hanged for treason and entered legend as martyrs instead of liberators. Even at the gallows, they were dignified and unrepentant. Even in failure, their raid terrorized the South, electrified the nation, and precipitated the Civil War, which broke out less than a year later. Fire on the Mountain is a story of what might have happened if John Brown's raid had succeeded. Yasmin Abraham Martin Odinga drove across the border at noon. The man and woman at the station looked at her Nova Africa plates and Sea Islands University sticker and waved her on through without even asking for papers. Yasmin figured she was probably the first stranger they had seen all morning. Laurel Gap was not a busy crossing, and most of the traffic from the looks of the road and the trucks in the area was church picnickers and relatives home for Sunday visits, all known to them. Mostly white folks on either side of the border through here, mostly older. Even socialist mountains give up their young to the cities. An hour later, Yasmin was in the valley heading north, with the high, straight, timbered wall of the Blue Ridge to her right, clothed in its October reds and golds. She scanned the radio back and forth between country on AM and sacred on AX ignoring the talk shows, enjoying the high silvery singing. There was no danger of running across the Mars news, not on a Sunday morning here in what Leon had often impatiently but always affectionately called the Holy Land. She eased up, up to 90, 100, 120, enjoying the smooth power of the big Egyptian car. She had a 200-click run down the valley to Staunton, and she couldn't shake the uncomfortable feeling that she was late. She was looking forward to seeing her mother-in-law, Pearl. She was, and she wasn't looking forward to seeing her daughter, Harriet. She had something to tell them both, but it wasn't for them. She was late. It was for the old man. She patted the ancient black leather doctor's bag beside her on the seat. In it were her great-grandfather's papers, which she was taking to Harper's Ferry to be read on the 100th anniversary of John Brown's attack, 50 years after they were written, according to the old doctor's very precise instructions. Except that it was October, and she was three months late. She had been asked to stay an extra month in Africa to finish the Old Duvi project. A month had turned into three, and she had missed the 4th of July centennial. A fax had been sent to the museum director, but it wasn't the same. Now she was bringing the original, according to the old man's will, in the stiff old pill-smelling doctor's bag that had held them for 36 years since he had died, the year she was born, hoping maybe 
that it would make it up to him. It's hard to know how to please the dead. Near Roanoke, she was slowed, then stopped, by buffalo. There was no hurrying the great herds that paced the continent's grassy corridors east to west. They always had the right of way across highways and even borders. These were heading south and west towards Cumberland Gap, where even the mountains would stand aside to let them pass. There was more traffic on towards Staunton. Dairy tankers deadheading home for the weekend, vans of early apple pickers from Quebec and Canada, Sunday go-to-meeting buses, even a few cars, mostly little inertial hummers. Things were changing since the Rev Second Revolutionary War. She heard more singing and reached over to scan the radio up, but it was the Atlanta-Baltimore airship, the silver and orange John Brown, motoring grandly past in the lee of the mountain. It sounded so joyful that Yasmin raced it for a few clicks before falling back and letting it go, worrying about potholes. The roads in the USSA were still unrebuilt, wide but rough, straight and shabby, like the long, low, worn-out mountains themselves. Appalachia, on either side of the border, was a well-worn part of the world. I am Dr. Abraham. When you read this, in 1959, what I have to say will be illuminated by the light of history, or perhaps obscured by the mists of time. Decide for yourself. I write as an old man. It is 1909. But I experienced these events as a boy. I was ignorant and profoundly so, for I was not only an African and doubly a slave, for no child is free, but an unlettered 12-year-old unaware even of how unaware I was, of how vast the world that awaited my knowing. There was only beginning to stir within me that eagerness my enemies would say greed for knowledge that has since guided my enemies would say misled, my exact half century of steps thereafter. Fifty years ago today, in 1959, in 1859, I was barely beginning to hunger, and I knew not what I hungered for, for hunger was the natural state of affairs in Shenandoah. Whatever the bourgeois historians tell us, and they are still among us, some in party garb, whatever lies they might polish and toss, the slave south was a poor land, P-O-O-R. Great grandson, do you even know what poor means 50 years in the future in your day of socialism? Electricity, nitrogen-fed catfish, world peace, and mules so smart they would talk if mules had anything in particular to say to us humans. In 1859, kids in Virginia and Caroline called Carolina before independence, didn't grow up. Half of them, of us, I mean, of colored, which is what we were beginning to call ourselves, forget that we were Africans at all. We thought Africa was where the old folks went when they died. And why not? That was what the old folks told us. The Shenandoah Valley was poor even for the whites, for it had the slavery without the cotton. There were plenty of what people called poor whites. Nobody ever said poor colored. That went without saying. Like cold snow or wet rain. Ignorance was the unshakable standard. The average man or woman, black or white, was as unlettered as a fence post and about as ashamed of the deficiency. I could, in fact, read. This was my sworn secret from all but Mama and Cricket, for she had learned me in letters in the hope that somehow, someday, someone might teach me to do what she couldn't. Combine them into words, and she was right. The trick was done by a tinker from Lebanon who laid up in our livery stable in the winter of 57 while he healed his bone sick horse. Arabs know two things, horses and letters, and he taught me enough of both to get by. I had to bite my tongue whenever my master, for I was owned as the Arab's horse. Joachim Deal gave up on a medicine label in frustration, but a colored boy 
reading was not to be tolerated even by a relatively tolerant Pennsylvania German like Deal. Yes, I fought with John Brown. Old Captain John Brown, and Tubman too. In fact, I helped bury the old man, as I will tell. I could show you his grave, but we swore an oath, six of us, six thousand of us, so I won't. If General Tubman is the mother of our country and Frederick Douglass the father, our Dixie Bolivar, then bloody old Shenandoah Brown, the scourge of Kansas, the avenging angel of Osawatomie, and the swamp of the swan, and the terror of the Blue Ridge, is some kind of godfather. Blood may be thicker than water, but politics is thicker than either, great-grandson, and I love the old man. I count myself as much as his kin as any of his actual sons. That brave abolitionist family band, who were the boldest of all his soldiers, willing even at times to stand up to their captain, a thing which I saw no other except Kagi ever do. No, I never rode into battle with Captain John Brown, for he was too old and I was too young. He was as old as I am now, and I was as young as your own child, if you have one. But I fetched him his pot-boiled, chicory-cut coffee on many a frosty morning, while he and Tubman consulted with Green and Stern Kagi. Then I watched him while he watched them ride off to war. Then he would sit by the fire reading his Bible and his Mazzini while his coffee got cold. While I helped Doc Hunter make his rounds, but always keeping one eye on the old man as the Doc ordered. End of part one.